Hello and welcome to Spotlight On, a production of 23 Media Ventures. I'm your host, Lawrence Purrier. Today, the spotlight shines on freelance journalist and author T. Krulos. T. wrote two books that I've enjoyed this year, Heroes in the Night, Inside the Real Life Superhero Movement from 2013, and 2020's American Madness, the story of the Phantom Patriot and how conspiracy theories hijacked American consciousness. Both of those works take the reader deep into parts of contemporary American society that are not often explored, and if they are, it's usually done with ridicule or scorn. T takes a different approach. He seeks to understand what kind of people are drawn to non-mainstream beliefs and movements, often at the risk of their personal relationships, their livelihood, their credibility, and in some cases, their very lives. He's also not afraid to insert himself into his stories, observing up close and often becoming an active participant in the world of his subjects. The results are a much more vulnerable and empathetic look at our fellow citizens and their sometimes troubling worldviews. I'm super excited to talk with you. Just to set the table a little bit, I read two of your books. I read Heroes in the Night, and I just finished American Madness. Mm. And there's a lot pinballing around for me. Yeah. From what I can gather from reading in your background, I'm a few years older than you, but I definitely grew up in an era of a lot of these topics. They were floating around in the 70s and 80s in popular television, things like In Search Of or UFOs were kind of a big thing. And it wasn't until a bit later that some of the more, what I would call the intersection of like religion and politics stuff emerged, you know, more late 80s into the 90s, and then certainly accelerated over the last 30 years. But with all that said, I think I, I wanted to understand a little bit about if the common sort of thread through a lot of your writing is this focus on subcultures and what I would broadly call like outsiders misunderstood it, however you want to characterize it, and, and with an overlay of like the Fortean and the paranormal. What's your entryway? What's your on-ramp to all that? Oh, it, it really comes from my childhood. It's so funny because when I think back about what I used to love to read as a kid, I loved to read superhero comic books. That's probably one of the first things that I read because I could figure out what was going on with the pictures and then translated into the words and i also really love to read adventure mystery and any book i could find on ghost stories bigfoot ufos stuff like that it was all very fascinating to me as a kid and little did i know this was very early research into what i would later write about and so i've always been fascinated by things that are mysterious and unusual and that, that really draws me in every time and then i think when i became a, a teenager i was in the punk rock subculture and i had friends who were goths and metalheads skaters stuff like that i very much loved youthful subcultures when i was a teen those all kind of melded together and i developed an interest in journalism and writing as well it all sort of came together I had a very similar experience growing up in terms of as a younger person, like as a pre-adolescent even, going to the library at school or going to the public library. And I've tried to piece together and unpack it, but I really, it's either lost to memory or the depths of psychology or whatever, but I tried to understand what was it that would cause me to enter the library and go find the weird stuff. You know <laughs> what I mean? It's because you know how it is like that stuff. You have to go look for it. Yeah. And I, I've really tried to understand that over the years. I can't find like the origin story clearly for me. And I wonder, like, do you know what it was about for you? Was it escapism? Was it, have you ever reflected on the why behind that? I think I was lucky and the, my father had a strong interest in science fiction, especially in monster movies. He has a lot of fond memories of fifties culture in general. So yeah. he introduced me to a lot of that when I was very young. 
And I, this is why I love librarians so much. I remember when I was a kid, there was a very helpful librarian that knew I had an interest in kind of weird stuff. So she would guide me in that direction a little bit. I think I was lucky to have adults in my life that were not like, oh, that's weird. Don't go there. They were like, oh, that's your thing. So here, let me help you find stuff that you're interested in. When you were younger, did you have any adults in your life who were also interested in the magical thinking, who were into the more the reality of some of these topics? I don't think so, actually. I don't think that I found very like-minded people until I became a teenager. Like I say, I was hanging with a subculture crowd, and a lot of them had interest in paranormal stuff, conspiracy stuff. That was the first time I was able to talk to like-minded people on the same level, I think. It's really interesting to think back about the time frame of what I'm going to guess would have been like your adolescence into young adulthood. It was like a, a golden era for a lot of these topics being in underground media, bubbling up into mainstream media, things like the X-Files or yeah, so many of the seminal books were the touchstone books of a lot of these subcultures came out in that era. So I'm sure there was no shortage of of immersion topics. Yeah, X-Files is a great thing to mention because I had an interest before that, but I was like at yeah, very right age to like be able to really watch and enjoy X-Files. It was very popular and it made me interested to go read books about UFOs and introduced conspiracy a little bit, even though this is a much friendlier version of what I would discover later on. Yeah, it was it was kind of the right time. I was really absorbing a lot of this late 80s through the early 90s. I want to come back a little later in our conversation about how you've seen the subcultures change over the last 25 years or so and the tone of them and sort of the menace that exists now, maybe in a way that didn't before. But before we get there, I wanted to talk a little bit about just a few of the recurring sort of elements or style or themes in, in what you cover and what your interests are. So we talked a little bit about subcultures of outsiders or and not even to go that far, just to say subcultures in general, people that have that gravitate around interests and build lifestyle around it. Another thing that is pretty glaring in, in, in your work is that you certainly don't make fun of your topics. You can have a little fun with it, but you're never, it never feels more than acknowledging the obvious, if you will. Like you don't go at your topics or your, the people you're talking to. And so that empathy, I, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, because I'm sure, as you know, in this literature, there's a spectrum of how people deal with the people they're talking to and, and the cultures they're investigating. How did you choose to have that line and not be mocking? Yeah. I think part of it stems from the fact that, like I said, I was part of like the punk rock subculture and I felt like I was an outsider and that people didn't understand me. I get that perspective of being someone who was seen as unusual and was still being a person that wants to be talked to in a respectful way. I'll also tell you, I don't think I've ever like really told the story, but when I was in my early 20s, I was starting to write and um, there's a short-lived publication an editor assigned me to write about a UFO meetup group. I went to their meeting and I didn't tell them that I was a writer. And then I wrote this piece and it was pretty snarky and, and rude about this group. I made fun of you know, some kind of outlandish beliefs, I think. So I wrote this and I think my editor encouraged me to have that tone. The piece got published and I, I read it and I felt like total crap. I was like, who are you to make fun of these people? Why is your opinion better than theirs? And people consider you to be unusual. I was very unhappy with it. And that was really a turning point for me where I was like, you're going to move forward and you're going to be respectful about your subject matter and certainly don't need to agree with them on everything that they think, but you have to give them the benefit of the doubt and be a respectful writer and person. I've always kept that in my mind. And even if I think someone is a little bit ridiculous, I'd rather present their story and let people make that decision for themselves. 
I think some people, for example, in my book, Heroes in the Night, read about real life superheroes and some probably laughed their way through the whole book. Some people probably read it and felt very inspired. That's really the reader's decision. It's funny because it's clear at times that you're wrestling with trying to hold an integrity while you're doing this and you disclose it in the narrative. You'll talk about, I could have been more honest or I was, I had to make a decision if I was going to be honest or if I was going to say my intention or that context is really helpful to hear as a reader. Yeah. I, th I think it helps if people understand that, you know, you're, you're a writer and we are also a person. So you sometimes do have to balance your own emotions and figure out your motivation. I never want the story to be about me, but I think there are some key points where it is helpful to let the readers know what's going on behind the scenes a little bit. Well, and there are definitely times where you're not afraid to be a participant in sort of that new journalism style. And there are moments where you disclose that as well. And there's moments where as a reader, it's like, oh, this is uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I really like those moments. You know, it's, I like that feeling that you get when you read something like that. But that immersion that you take with your subjects and your subject matter, both in the research you have to do, and you talk about that a lot, certainly in the McCaslin book, like you had to read a lot of things that probably you can't get out of your head after you first read them. And I wish, yeah. Yeah. And hear things that you don't want to hear. How does that boil down in terms of objectivity? And is that even like a desired state for you? Or yeah, how do you think about that? I, I try to be objective if I can. But I mean, the reality is it's so hard to have that, especially in, in this day and age. I think it's hard to have an objective look. I certainly try to, but writers are, are people that have opinions on stuff too. So yeah. it is hard to balance out sometimes. I came across your work because I moved to Seattle from New York about seven years ago. And when I first got here, two things intersected for me. One was my oldest son and I watched the movie Kick-Ass, which, by the way, I mean, come on, it's so great. And, but at the same time, I learned about Phoenix Jones, who is a Seattle real-life superhero. I couldn't get that out of my head. Like, I hadn't been familiar with the topic of real-life superheroes before. Although I've had a lifelong interest in a lot of the other topics you explore, but I couldn't get the real life superhero thing out of my head. And so I came up with an idea of a way I wanted to get into it and explore it and learn about these people. And as I started to do that initial work, I came across your book. And first of all, your book saved me from going down a rabbit hole that I probably wouldn't have been as successful with because I couldn't devote the time and energy in the manner you did. But it also made the other idea completely unnecessary. It really is like the, it's it, unless you're going to do like an academic psychological look at these people, it's the definitive story. But the thing that did captivate me about that topic was trying to understand the psychology of it. Who does this? Not in a judgmental way, but in an understanding way. It's such a fascinating hobby, pursuit, interest to actually take the step to do it. Yeah. That, that, that leap from cosplay to going out on the street and like, I'm now I'm going to do a patrol. It's heavy. It's really heavy. It's easy to laugh at and dismiss, but it's not trivial. No, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's wild. It's frightening. So sometimes there, there's a, a good range that I found. I met some real life superheroes or RLSH, as they say in breed, that had a very tame, accessible approach, right? They're just, they love superheroes. They, they want to do something good. They're a colorful advocate of doing good deeds or, or charity. And then there are some that were definitely almost like they had a death wish. The line between reality and fantasy is very blurred for them and actually want to go out and, and fight crime, which is never like it is in the comic books. Often in the circumstances where it has unfolded, it's been a confusing mess, a danger to themselves and sometimes other people. I think there's a variety of the approaches and personality types that are engaged with this. It differs a lot from person to person. A lot of times people have been like, real life superheroes, tell me what's all about in one sentence. And I'm like, I can't really do that because it's, it varies quite a bit. 
Yeah, I think the book conveys that there is no singular motivation or singular personality type that does it. There, maybe there's classifications or groups of people or categories, but there's, there's definitely a spectrum of people. And I think it has a lot to do with over the last, what has it been now, 20 years, superheroes are such a part of our pop culture. They've adapted practically every superhero ever made into a movie or a TV show and they're just everywhere. So it's just, I think that really influences people that this is part of our culture and I can be part of that by becoming a superhero myself, then maybe I'll be someone big and famous. It's interesting too, that you mentioned, and you talk about in the book, a lot of the patrols, nothing happens. It's mundane. There is no purse snatcher or man lurking in the shadows. And I don't know how much interaction or relationships you have with law enforcement people, but my dad was a cop and I grew up around cops and it's the same thing. Most of their job, they're not doing a whole lot. Even when we're in a high crime period, like when people say crime's rampant, n not really, <laughs> not in America, not in, the, not in the late 20th, early 21st century. It goes up and down in a very narrow band and it's typically isolated by geography and Subgeographies, but yeah, it's interesting. And the other thing is, I remember I had someone like online on Facebook or something, and they were all mad because their friend had gotten mugged or something here in Milwaukee. And they're like, "Where were the real life superheroes?" I'm like, "Well, they're not omnipresent. They're not everywhere. The chance that they would encounter that particular crime happening in the city is is so remote." Because I went out on patrol with them. We would go uh, and patrol a neighborhood that had crime problems and we wouldn't see anything. And then the next morning I'd be like, oh yeah, there was a mugging. It just happened to be 10 blocks that way an hour after the patrol ended. It's yeah. like a, a needle in the haystack. I remember there was the study where I think it was liquor stores or bodegas or something like that, where they put a cardboard cutout of a cop or a security officer in there and crime goes down. It seems very similar. Like who's going to commit... First of all, if there's witnesses around at all, but who's going to commit a crime in the vicinity of two or three or four like costumed people? Yeah, at the very least, they're witnesses. At most, they're like incredibly complicated. <laughs> you know, you're not going to mess around. Yeah. When there's... <laughs> that is something that I talked to the real life superheroes about and speculated. They're like, oh, it's a slow patrol. Nothing happened. I'm like, maybe it was slow because they saw you marching down the street and they're like, whatever this is. I'm out of here. I'm going to go try a different neighborhood. Maybe not stopping crime, but deflecting it a little bit. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah. It's, hard. it's hard to tell. It really is. I read Heroes in the Night. I read American Madness. I did not get to Monster Hunters and Apocalypse any day now. And we could, we, but I still feel sort of equipped enough to talk about those topics. But with all that said, can you talk a little bit about the Venn diagram of people in those worlds? <laughs> It was great because American Madness was the fourth of those books. It feels like that drew a little bit from the first three books. Heroes in the Night, certainly the, the main subject, Richard McCaslin identified with that movement, although he wasn't especially an active part of it. Apocalypse Any Day Now dealt with different people's ideas on how the world might end. So some of those ideas were religious or from the perspective of climate disasters but there is definitely an overlap of conspiracy theory in that realm as well a lot of people are preppers because they believe the government's gonna be rounding up people and sending them to fema camps in the near future and stuff like that and monster hunters deals with paranormal which again like some of those circles in ufo research and other aspects intersect with conspiracy theory as well, or even end times uh, theories, you know, an alien in invasion that's going to change the world as we know it. I think all of those books straddle the line a little bit about people with one foot in reality and one foot in kind of fantasy of this thing may or may not exist, right? The world might end, but I don't know. That's, there's a little bit of fantasy to that, I think. So, Yeah, although after this summer, I'm not... Right. Yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. The yeah. fantasy gets closer to reality. 
one thing that I have found a little bit difficult to discern, and I'm, I'm sure it's by design, is your take on a lot of this. I don't want to pin you down and ask, what do you believe? But I'm interested in your cosmology around some of these topics. Like, do you like to think about and explore and take seriously the UFO problem or cryptozoology? You know, are any of these things that you either, I don't want to say give credence to, but I think you know what I'm asking. Like, is any of this a personal area of interest and an actual study of the phenomenon as opposed to the people around the phenomenon? I would describe myself as being very curious. I like to think open-minded. But I have that journalist streak where I'm like, okay, where's the evidence? Show me something that's definitive that I can reference. I always love to hear about these topics. Let's say something like Bigfoot. Does Bigfoot exist? I can't really say definitively that it does. I've seen some very interesting things that could be or could not be. I'm open to the subject, but I don't, I don't necessarily believe it. But I'm also not like a very hardcore debunker where I'm like, no, no way. Absolutely not. That's uh, my attitude towards a lot of things. I think very interested, love to hear about it. Not entirely sold on the whole thing. Do you like maybe? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I know it's a weak position to have sometimes, but I can't definitively say either way, but maybe that'll change. I don't know if that is a weak position because one of my favorite thinkers is Robert Anton Wilson. And he used to always speak against the idea of belief in anything and being too certain about anything. And usually the people that are the most certain end up being the most dogmatic around their certainty. And pretty much everything, there's a maybe until proven, which means there's a maybe not until proven. And it's just a reliance on, I guess, the scientific method, maybe a fetishization of that or a, or a high re regard for it. I think where people who are sort of the observers of the subject get caught up or tripped up is that there's seemingly evidence everywhere. <laughs> we just can't see it. <laughs> right, right, right. And, and, and something that's been very, that's also very interesting about your approach is, and I'm wondering if you're familiar with this phenomenon, but a lot of people who try to study some of these topics, and to me, the, the most famous example I use is the JFK assassination. Mm -hmm. When you start to unpack it and get into these things, the rabbit hole becomes very consuming very quickly. And even if you consider yourself a pretty rational person or whatever, you're like, that is weird. Or yeah. like, why did all the, why did everybody die? Or like, why, why did such and such, how did so-and-so get connected to this other person? And it can become, for lack of a better way to say it, a mind fuck pretty quickly. Some of these topics, what tools did you have to develop? Or was it just your temperament that kept you from like, how, how did you inoculate against the mind fuck? <laughs> One good thing was I knew that's what I was going into. I was like, I know this is going to be, it's really going to suck me in, especially American Madness. That was some intense yeah. stuff at times. I've been fooled by stuff and I've definitely changed my opinion on different topics. Yeah, it's, it is a struggle. There was definitely times where I felt like I was falling down the rabbit hole and had maybe gotten in too deep. I think after Apocalypse Any Day Now and American Madness, I was like, you need to cleanse the palate by like reading Hello Kitty comics for a month or something. Try to get your mind out of that world because I can see how people get sucked into it and how it can consume their lives. And it becomes a very dark place. It's dangerous. We'll be back with more Spotlight On right after this break. I want to let you know that we have the first of a small line of Spotlight On collectibles available at spotlightonpodcast.com slash store. Just in time to treat yourself or someone you care about to a gift this upcoming holiday season. Have a look. And now, back to Spotlight On. Where I keep coming back to is that, yes, I believe people are responsible for how they behave. Uh, yes, I believe we have responsibilities as citizens, etc. But there's a predatory nature about so much of this. And it's a merciless predatory nature. You talked a bit about Alex Jones in your book. Well, quite a bit. And there was a couple of interviews I heard 
leading up to our talk that have really stuck with me. And I pulled some things I wanted to ask you about. And one of them was Naomi Klein is making the rounds of pretty much every podcast I listen to talking about her new book, The Doppelganger. A lot of it has to do with the world of like conspiracy and the paranoia and overlap between religion and politics in our country. She has a great line in one of the interviews where she said, um, I'm going to paraphrase, but it was basically like she she wishes in her book she didn't use the words conspiracy theory mm. because they they don't really have any theories. They say shit. There's no theory there behind it. I guess it's almost a nihilism, but she thinks of them as conspiracy influencers. I think given what, what we were just starting to talk about, they, they could even be conspiracy predators. So clearly there's a class of people who I, I assume it's just about money and attention and prestige. But there's this weird in-between area where it's like anything else in media. There's superstars and there's everybody else. There's not a lot of people making a lot of money off peddling conspiracy. Maybe I don't understand the economics of independent publishing. Maybe it is a good enough lifestyle business, or maybe the problem's bigger than I think. But one of the other things she said that I found really powerful because I was reading your book at the time was that conspiracy theories seem like they're anti-establishment, but they serve the establishment really well because they put off when the problem is like the UFOs are going to come and there's going to be an invasion or they're going to come get our guns or, you know, whatever the boogeyman is. And it takes people's eyes off the very real problems of right now, the creeping fascism and the extreme capitalism, all the real social ills that and, and the cultural sickness we're facing right now. That, that really stuck with me, that notion. And I guess before I ask you questions around that, the other strand that came into me was this, this guy, Jeff Charlotte, whose work I wasn't familiar with. And he's got a book out right now called The Undertow. For about 20 years, he's been writing on this intersection of American politics and religion. He goes and immerses himself in the mega churches and the Christian right and the gun enthusiasts. And something he said is that in the last 10 years, especially, it's gotten more dangerous for him in a very real way. So it used to be you could go to these places and maybe there'd be a big picnic or a barbecue and they'd invite you in. And you, a lot of the experiences I, I read of you, like people would just all of a sudden start talking this stuff as though because you were there, you were on the team. And there was almost like an inability to read social cues. They just start telling you this stuff. Whereas he said, now he goes and he shows up and they're like, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. You don't look like one of us. And it's much more dark. And everybody's excited about the civil war. Like that was one of his points. It's like they all five minutes into the conversation, it gets to the civil war is coming and they're excited and ready. Have you felt an evolution either in your own work or as an observer, have you seen it go from this subculture of fringe people and who had their own little universe to something different and darker and maybe less containable? Yeah, for sure. The first thing is, uh, you're right in that I think people used to be a conspiracy theorist. There was sort of this golden age where people did have a theory. And like you say, JFK, they'd be able to show you how they came up with this theory. And a lot of times, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but it made sense. It followed this. Had like uh, an internal logic. Yeah. And you could see where they had scraps of information. Same thing with a lot of UFO stuff. And that did evolve into people just coming up with a theory that felt good in their gut. And then they would be like, this has got to be the case. Reptilian aliens. I've never seen any sort of good working theory on that. There's no scraps of evidence really, other than maybe some videos where someone's eyes look blurry because the studio lights are changing or something. But I'm like, where did you get this from? Just kind of pulled it out of the air. And I definitely saw it evolve into becoming more cult-like and more dangerous throughout the process of writing American Madness and in the aftermath after the book got published too. So I really got introduced to this world in 2010 when I met Richard McCaslin for the first time. He had contacted me and I was like, wow, this guy must be the fringe of the fringe. Like 
his ideas are so out there. And then I slowly discovered there's actually a lot of people who thought the same way as him. But I definitely saw that intensify as the years went on. And it was really shocking. And at this point, there's now people who are members of Congress whose ideas are not that far removed from Richard McCaslin. I'm like, this is exactly the same type of stuff that he would tell me. And it's mainstream now. It's definitely its own political force. Before I comment on that, I guess what I would like to ask you then is extrapolate from that. There are people in the halls of Congress. There are people, not even mid-level people. There were very senior people in the previous administration. Let's put Trump aside because I really don't think he believes anything. I just think he's such an opportunist and grifter that there's no belief there. Just whatever is useful at the moment. But Michael Flynn would be sort of exhibit A. And then it's just there's plenty of others from there. A point I want to make, too, is that's like looking at, wow, people in this kind of big position of power being in Congress or being in the presidential cabinet. But almost equally is concerning, I think, is that people with these thoughts are now on your local school board deciding what your your kids can and can't read, making decisions that affect your community. This easy to laugh off conspiracy, like, oh, how this person believes the world is flat or something. But it should be concerning because those people are networking and they're running for office and trying to gain control of decisions that affect you and your community directly. Something that's really striking to me about the situation overall is that no one seems to be able to articulate an antidote. And you point out something really well in American Madness, which is, and again, it resonated for me because in a different way, in the Jeff Charlotte interview I heard, he said something similar, which was, you can't go have a conversation and convince someone. And he said he used to try to do that. He would go to somebody and just try to say, but look at this information, like they've never came for your guns or, or you know, whatever the topic was. And then he said, what I had to realize was I do the same thing. I can't be convinced either. I can't be convinced to stop being a secular humanist or a progressive liberal or a budding leftist. So what makes me think I could go change them from their worldview? Yeah. And you articulated it even a little bit more expansively in terms of seeing how these people react when confronted with the sort of shortcomings or when prophecy didn't come to pass, whatever it was. Like the, there, there, are, there is no fact and evidence that could help these folks change their mind. There's no antidote, like truth isn't an antidote, fact isn't an antidote. And I don't like to be pessimistic. I don't like to be nihilistic, but I I have a hard time seeing the other side. Like, how do we see through to the other side? Like, how do we move forward? What does it look like in five years? I mean, going into this presidential cycle with the deep fake problem, like, it's really, it's, it's befuddling in a way that I never would have, I don't know. Yeah, I'm afraid that next year is going to be a big year for conspiracy theory. It's it's going to be off the hook. Yeah, it's really, it is a very frustrating thing because if someone believes the world is flat, how can you even make a, an argument with that person? Because you can show them anything. You can show them photos from Hubble and, and outer space and all sorts of things, and they're just going to tell you it's fake. Any sort of paperwork photo, video can be dismissed as just being fake. It's tough. The one piece of advice someone said is, I I think, first of all, you should try to talk to them. You don't need to get sucked in and try to agree with them. But I I think it is worth having conversations with some people. And a tip that I got was one thing you could do is ask them to explain their theory and how they got there. And sometimes just them talking about it and saying it out loud, they begin to realize in real time that it doesn't really make sense. Hmm. And you don't need to argue with them at this be like, do you think that's a, a good source of information? Where where did this come from? Do you have a link and stuff like that? I really hope, and I know there are efforts already, schools need to have media literacy courses so people at a young age can start to realize that this is a problem 
and look at examples of what is credible news and what isn't. Because it's only going to get worse. Like you said, the deep fake technology is improving at a very remarkable rate. And there has been a little bit of a pushback now against conspiracy sites with platforms like YouTube trying to crack down on it, but it's very hard to do. You push it down one place and it pops up in another. It's definitely a fight and it's going to be a tough one. When does it go from being entertaining mm. to like cultural commentary and criticism? When I first started on the book in 2010, I was like, oh, this guy, he's into conspiracy. And this guy goes back to X-Files. I like that show. There were these characters on the show called the Lone Gunmen, and they were depicted as being these kind of quirky, weird guys, but they were also smart, and they like knew how to tie things together. And, uh, and a lot of times they weren't completely wrong. I had this kind of charming vision of conspiracy, and I was very interested in UFOs. But after I started talking to Richard, I had not heard of Alex Jones at that point. Then I saw that there was this very dark and destructive side to it. And that has done lots of damage to people's lives. Richard McCaslin, I think his life was pretty much destroyed by conspiracy theory. It does have a very negative impact on a lot of people to this day. And it is very much culturally motivated. That was something that switched, I think, with people like Alex Jones, is they just wanted to channel conspiracy to help their hatred of certain political forces and institutions. That's a very good weapon to use. And certainly the last administration knew that was a, a good weapon in their toolbox. Yeah. Have you encountered or have you read, is there like, is there a, is there a seminal biography of him yet that sort of explains like, cause clearly like, I just have a sense that there's a book or a story to be told about him where like how he got, how he is probably makes total sense. Alex Jones, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, I have pieced it together through different stuff. I remember Rolling Stone actually wrote a pretty good article that talked about his early life. John Ronson wrote a book called Them. He wrote the book in 2000. So he was capturing Alex Jones as he was beginning his rise right around then. So those were two good sources of information on him early on. I'm sure that there There'll be more to be said about him, especially because he's been in the news a lot over the last couple of years with all those lawsuits. Finally, he's gotten a billion dollars in fines, I think, related to the Sandy Hook lawsuits. It's quite a story. And, and he's made so much money from peddling these conspiracy theories with his bogus supplements and other products. It was interesting to go back to the interview I heard with Naomi Klein, she was talking about like the, that, that supplements racket and how even with Joe Rogan, a lot of the right leaning and far right people are in that body health business. She was like, that's because the fascists are obsessed with the pure body, like the purity of whether it's your blood or your health, like it's a very recognizable part of the far right playbook. It's also kind of an American thing. Take this snake oil. Yes, you'll be really strong and all of your hair will grow back. You know, I don't have yeah. to do the hard work. I could just get the result. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned earlier about palate cleansing. I wonder to the extent that you've got some thoughts that you're willing to share. What's sort of next for you? I know a lot of times when these topics or these even broadly, this sort of this alt field grab somebody, it's kind of hard to leave alone because it's so interesting. But what's your journey taking you to next? Do you know yet? I'll say I have a, probably two or three different book ideas that I'm developing now. I haven't sold the books or anything. Gotcha. But I'm, I'm slowly developing and I, I think they'll all happen, but it's just a matter of what order they're going to happen in. And in the meantime, I've been doing a lot of freelance writing. I write locally here for Milwaukee Magazine. I've written a few pieces now for Atlas Obscura, which has been fun. So yeah, I've been freelancing a lot of articles and developing some book ideas. 
which these book ideas are not going to be as intense a ride, but they still do venture into the world of the paranormal and unusual subcultures. Something that I've enjoyed watching as I was prepping for our interview is I love the focus of some of your work on like your local and regional stories, because that's something that's always been interesting to me. I've not moved around a ton in my life, but whenever I do, I like to read about where I live, right? Like whether it's the actual building or the neighborhood or the street or the town, you know, whatever it is, it's just fun to connect that way for me. I love the bizarre stories and they're all over America. You know, it's, it's like anywhere you go, there's whether it's local ghost stories or the local cryptoid or, (laughs) you know, and it's it's like this endless Americana well. I, I love local stories too, because sometimes you're like, I did not even know this about my own backyard. And there's something really interesting that I had no idea. You think you know everything about the region that you live in, but you would be surprised. Well, another quick question, because I didn't read the book, and I'm sorry, but where did you arrive with Mothman? <laughs> well, <laughs> I love Mothman. Yeah, I, I do too. It's really an American monster icon, I really think. I got interested in this because there seemed to be a wave of Mothman sightings in Chicago. I live in Milwaukee, which is just about an hour and a half north of Chicago. So I don't go there all the time, but I, I've certainly been there several times. And I was like, wow, this is kind of my backyard. I'm interested. But as these cases started to unroll, it became obvious that a lot of them were being written by the same person that was just sending these in anonymously to websites that are really eager for paranormal news. So they're like, wow, another Mothman sighting. And I guess being a writer, one thing I noticed, I'm like, the pacing in some of the word usage of these reports is very similar to each other. I think this is someone who is just trolling and doing it for a cheap thrill or whatever motivation, I don't know. I do know that there were some people who saw something, but a problem was everything was getting lumped in as a Mothman, right? Someone said they saw something that looked like a pterodactyl. Okay, Mothman. Another person saw a humanoid figure and that was a Mothman too. So some people I think genuinely had something happen and they actually did talk about it. But a large number of these reports, we have no idea who wrote them. There's no name. There's no contact information. A lot of it is just a hoax, I think. Yeah, I guess if you wanted to be a thrill seeker or if you wanted to culture jam your local media, and if you wanted to evade smart analysis from someone like you, you'd need a few people writing. And and I mean, this really ties into the conspiracy thing. People are sharing this news, but it's not legitimate. It's something created on the internet and You can't believe everything that you read on the internet. Listen, I, I, in the last 72 hours, I got tricked by one. I don't know if if you were reading the paper or if you were reading the news, but there was the UAP hearings in Mexico. Oh yeah. Yeah. And they had bodies. They had in air quotes, alien bodies. And I was like, what the hell is this? And looking at the pictures and then the story, I'm like, well, whoa, this is mind blowing. And then you look and it's, oh, it's not cited anywhere. That's not some weird website you've never heard of. And -hmm. then it turns out what I read today was that the guy who presented the, in air quotes, evidence is like some known hoaxer. Yeah. And somehow he got his way into the hearing and was presented as credible. And it's like, ah, another day, another 10 pounds bullshit. (laughs) Yeah, I get fooled on the internet too. There's some site and they always drive me crazy because it has some superhero movie news and it'll look like this movie is actually going to happen. But if you actually click on the article and read it, they're like, this is rumored or this is like sources say someone thought could be a good movie, but there's like very little to it. It's just clickbait. It's incredible, isn't it? I'm no PhD, but I feel moderately well equipped to navigate it. I feel so awful for either my fellow citizens or people who just, you know, it's just, it's tough, man. It's really tough. Yeah. It's really tough. So what could we say to go out on a high note? (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> Tell me something um, good. Something that I have encountered, and this has been maybe a little bit more for free, freelancing and stuff. There are a lot of people who do a lot of good in the world. And I think it's it's important to stop and reflect on that and appreciate it. There are people who are trying to make the world a better place. There's people who are trying to fight against disinformation and the harm that it does. That's encouraging to see. Okay, I'll take it. I'll take it. It, it. Thank you so much for making time to do this. I've really enjoyed talking to you. I've enjoyed your work. I really enjoy the sort of empathy and compassion that comes through with it all. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, T. Krulos. As always, thank you for listening to Spotlight On, a production of 23 Media Ventures. I'm your host and executive producer, Lawrence Purry. We're produced and edited by Michael Donaldson with theme music by Qburn's Abstract Message. For past episodes, web-only exclusives, to make a donation to support our production and to join our mailing list, visit us online at spotlightonpodcast.com. Thanks for listening. Be safe and stay in touch. Stay in touch.